good morning everybody it's a pleasure uh, to be here and uh, and talk about the next 20 or minutes genetic epidemiology of sars cov2 and emerging infectious diseases now when we talk about microbiology or emerging infectious diseases what we should really keep in mind is that uh, all of modern microbiology is indebted to one this man uh, anthony von leeuwenhoek who was uh, a profession a municipal official but by passion and science so what he invented was this handheld device what we today call as a microscope and using the microscope we could describe a, a number of organisms which were previously not visible to the naked eye now that really changed the way we understand the environment around us and uh, fast forward also understand the pathogens around us in terms of what really causes diseases now in parallel to uh, the, the advances in microbiology there was also uh, another advance which has uh, largely been happening over the last two or three decades and that has been our ability to sequence genomes not just of humans but also of a number of other organisms around us which includes plants and animals and of course pathogens and what really uh, was a landmark was of course Uh, the announcement of the completion of the human genome uh, and what really happened after that was a significant advancement in technology which would mean that you could sequence genomes uh, much more faster much more cost effective uh, and to give a perspective uh, the the y axis in this, uh, in this graph out here which is essentially the cost per million days uh, is essentially the log order so what in summary this would mean is that you could sequence nucleotide sequences of organisms Uh, or the genomes of organisms at a quite affordable fast uh, 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 and, and, and in a clinical turnaround time. Now you might ask how does it really impact uh, clinical settings? And to understand that you need to understand that all pathogens that we know today also have known sequences. And compared to the traditional approaches of identifying the causative organism in an outbreak or a caus causative organism in a patient with disease or infection. what typically we would do is to uh, uh, isolate the organism uh, sort of culture them in in different media conditions and in many ways also observe them under the microscope or using very specific assay systems either in cell based systems or biochemical systems now i said before that all organisms that we know today do have uh, a genome and in almost all cases with very minor exceptions the genomes do have dna or rna and the genetic material now what this would also mean is that with the advancement in technology for genomics you could identify organisms out of an infection without having to go through uh, having to go through the traditional ways of microbiology now that would also allow us to understand not just what really caused the, the disease or infection but also in our ability to characterize the genome of the organism and this could provide very useful insights into for example uh, the antimicrobial resistance or, or for that matter uh, immune evasion property of particular organism now i'm a journey into looking at microbes and whole genome sequencing of microbes they back uh, started they back in almost a decade ago uh, when we encountered uh, a bunch of Uh, researchers who were working on this very interesting outbreak uh, in shrimp of course um and this is a really big economic problem because india is one of the largest exporters of shrimp now what really happened was that there was a virus which would infections and which would cause this very characteristic white spot on shrimp and therefore called white spot shrimp virus and of course there were molecular technologies which were used to detect this virus including ptr and anti ptr uh, assay systems but suddenly this assay system stopped working but nevertheless shrimp were being affected and this would cause enormous economic loss to farmers who were culturing shrimp and that's when we were also working and we worked closely with a number of uh, organizations very specifically uh, dr shahul hamid uh, who runs an oi lab at the Abdul Fatim College in uh, in Wellu now what we did in this particular uh, assay system was to actually take an infected shrimp and we had to phenotype 
crush the virus, uh, and of course the shin, uh, which also includes the virus, and sequence it directly. And after sequencing, we could use an elaborate computational approach, which is sort of summarizing here. Uh, quite difficult to understand, but in, in, in very great summary, what I could say is that this bioinformatics pipeline would look for very specific signatures or KMOS in the data and sort of be able to separate the host genome from the virus. So what you see as a second peak out here is essentially the virus. And if once you can separate this virus genome, you, know, you could uh, assemble the virus in almost anything that. Now, this was essentially what we uh, sort of did way back a uh, decade ago. And what we showed is that you could assemble the complete genome of the virus from just one shrimp sample, which is infected with the virus. And more, uh, what we could show is that uh, the genome had multiple deletions, and some of these deletions were overlapping the primer binding sites, which were uh, used for the diagnosis of this virus, sort of explaining why the diagnostic did not work in this particular case. And of course, we published this much later, but to prove the point that you could use genomic technology to understand not just outbreaks, to understand what really caused outbreaks, and more importantly, to be able to understand the genetic architecture of the infectious disease that actually caused outbreaks. Now, fast forward into 2020, and that is essentially when the COVID pandemic struck the world. And if you really go back to the literature and the publication which actually depicted or described the first SARS-CoV-2 genome, you would see that none of the traditional microbiology approaches were used in this particular case. What essentially the researchers used was essentially to isolate uh, the nucleic acid material from the bronchoalveolar lavage of the patient and directly to an RNA extraction and sequencing. And from the sequencing, they could identify that this is a coronavirus quite distinctly different from other coronaviruses described. And therefore, they could name it as a novel coronavirus. In other words, uh, contrary to the, the traditional ways of microbiology, where you would need to isolate the virus and observe the virus under the microscope and then do further characterization in cell lines, you could sidestep all of these approaches in one single step by sequencing the genome, which not only provides an identity to pathogen, but also be able to tell that this is a new pathogen very closely related to other pathogens which have been sequenced in this type before. Now, our ability to actually understand more about SARS-CoV-2 was thanks to genetic epidemiology programs, which would enable sequencing of tens of hundreds, if not millions of SARS-CoV-2 genomes across India and across the world. Now, the key to our, to our ability to sequence large number of viruses was a multiplex, uh, what we call assay system, which today is called COVID Seq. And uh, we are fortunate to have been one of the first uh, labs across the world to have uh, piloted this approach for clinical samples uh, in, in, in not just in India, but also across the world, and to be able to mine this data to provide very useful information which is uh, relevant for public health data. And this was uh, built uh, by a bunch of researchers who put together the analytical pipeline, and this was done in the lab of Dr. Sridhar And summary what this assay system could enable us is that we could sequence anything from 750 samples to 3,000 samples, enabling detection of SARS-CoV-2, as well as the genomic epidemiology of SARS-CoV-2. And one of the first states to sort of implement this was the state of Kerala, where uh, we showed that over a year's time, this genomic epidemiology program, which involved multiple medical colleges, 12 medical colleges, state public and uh, regional health uh, institutes or laboratories, two university centers, and district surveillance units put together uh, and systematic sampling from all the districts we could understand what are the emerging lineages of SARS-CoV-2, and this enabled the government to take very proactive action in trying to curb the spread of the virus. And this could also provide very unique insights onto the spread of, uh, of the virus. Uh, that was largely because it was widely believed that uh, many of the SARS-CoV-2 cases in the state of Kerala early in the pandemic 
the cost of international travelers just because they have very large number of expatriates. But what we showed using genomic data was that outbreaks in the state of Kerala were largely dominated by viruses from nearby outbreaks uh, across the states of Tamil Nadu and the Pradesh and so forth. Now, following the success of the initial uh, SARS CoV 2 uh, epidemiology program in Kerala, today we have a national program which today is called INSACOG, which sort of looks at the genetic epidemiology of SARS CoV 2, not just across the state of Kerala, but also now spread across the country involving multiple research organizations. And through this process, we also build one of the largest compendium of, uh, of resources, both in terms of understanding genetic variants, in terms of uh, sharing genetic variants, and in terms of looking at phylogenetic maps of uh, viruses across, uh, very specifically to SARS-CoV-2, across India and of course, across the world. Now fast forward into 2022, um, there was an outbreak of monkey pox, and this outbreak was largely out of a super spreader event in Europe, with, of course, multiple cases uh, in quick succession reported from across Europe, with a significant number which caused deaths. And, of course, there was a second outbreak in the month of July, and this has been the lumpy skin disease of cattle. Both of them have commonality being fox viruses, and this outbreak had resulted in a uh, few million cattle which were infected and a significant amount of cattle which died. So in 2022, most likely would be called as the, the, the year of the pox. Now, genomic data was pouring in from across the world, including genomic data which came out of uh, the National Institute of Virology in Pune for the monkeypox outbreak. And a uh, quick analysis of the, the virus genome of the monkeypox outbreak but we realized that the, the outbreak which was in Europe was distinctly different or clustered quite distinctly different from the outbreak cluster out of samples from the early samples that I think from Canada and much later from Delhi. And what we show is that epidemiologically and genomically, these two outbreaks are quite distinctly different. And this would also enable us to name a new lineage, which is today called the F2 lineage, quite distinctly different from the outbreak lineage which is spreading across entire Europe. And today now we have multiple other members for this particular lineage uh, in countries ranging from the United States to Thailand and many more genomes you know, available. And today we know that this epidemiologic link uh, of samples of early monkeypox samples in India were absolutely unrelated to the outbreak which has occurred across the world and across Europe. So this would provide uh, healthcare administration and public health uh, uh, implementation differences in, in our ability to track and trace outbreaks and also bring in policy to sort of counter the spread of the virus. And what we showed uh, with this uh, particular uh, data set, which was available from the National Institute of Virology, was that the new lineage was characterized by 16 distinct genetic variations and, and therefore, uh, they could be classified quite distinctly different from all the other viruses which came out of the European outbreak. Now, when we talk about uh, the, the monkeypox virus, we should also talk about other viruses. Uh, the related viruses of the monkeypox, which is an orthopox virus, are the rabbit pox, the cowpox, and the variola. And I'm, I'm sure you would know this because these are also the vaccine strains uh, which could be used uh, for. Um, the smallpox. And a quite related virus is essentially the capripox viruses, which largely affects cattle, uh, which is a lumpy skin disease, which affects the goats and the sheep, which are otherwise called the goat pox and the sheep. And uh, in genomic uh, distinction, they're quite distinct to each other, but also share quite a large similarity in the core set of genes, uh, which are embedded and shared between all the pox viruses. Now, lumpy skin disease is not an infection of humans, but an infection of cattle. And this is a disease which has largely been endemic in Africa until uh, later on 2005, when it started emerging in other areas outside Africa, uh, first in the Central uh, Asia, uh, in and around Kazakhstan, in quite quick succession, uh, spreading across uh, entire Asia, uh, especially Southeast Asia. And there have been reports uh, even in India 
early uh, outbreak in 2019 in the state of Orissa, which has infected a few cattle and of course it caused a few deaths. But what really happened after 2019 was a large outbreak in 2022, which infected a large number of cattle. And we are fortunate to have worked with um, uh, the, the state government of Rajasthan, which was badly hit with this particular virus. And what we showed using genome sequencing is that the, the lumpy skin disease outbreak in the state of Rajasthan was quite distinctly different from the clusters of outbreaks previously uh, documented from India in 2019 and previously documented from across Southeast Asia and Central Asia uh, in, in the previous three to four years. And what this would also mean is that this is a new distinct lineage of lumpy skin disease. Uh, which was infecting cattle in India. And it still continues to spread. And there have been reports of continued spread of this virus across multiple states, especially in the northeastern region of India, even in 2020. So moving fast forward, we need to understand that genomics is just one part of our ability for prediction and preparedness. And what we really need to keep in mind is that the central theme of all of this is to uh, pull together data what we call as epidemic intelligence. This would come from global and regional uh, initiatives and data sharing uh, uh, processes. And you could actually pull together a variety of data sources, not just genomic data, but also things like human mobility networks in terms of looking at uh, uh, outbreaks with that climate uh, change derived. You could look at new sources and, of course, model this in the what we call as epidemic intelligence. And we are fortunate to have worked with a, a group of researchers in Kerala uh, who have volunteered to put together the software resources, the data resources in open source, which can enable epidemic intelligence to happen at a much larger scale. And before I close, I would like to also bring that th there could be a few examples of how this could be done. For example, uh, in the case of Zika or in the case of dengue. Now, it's very interesting that there was there has been Zika outbreaks in 2021 in the state of Kerala, largely cases emanating from the southern districts of the Mandram. And uh, since Zika and Dengue and the course Zika and Gunia would share the same vector, you could pretty much model the spread of uh, the potential spread of the virus by looking at a map of Dengue infection, for example, in 2021. And you would see pretty much they would overlap, at least in the state of uh, Kerala. And this would allow us to predict which are the new regions which are likely to be hit by Zika. And if you really look at the, the data which has come out um, from the ICMR using mosquito surveys, which has suggested that there is 0.05% possibility, that means that it is not too late to act upon uh, the emerging infectious disease, which is Zika. Now, of course, we should also keep in mind that digital solutions could actually open up newer opportunities in understanding infection and, of course, surveying and surveillance of this infectious disease. And a variety of in, uh, digital tools have been used across the world. This includes the flu survey by the UK, um, uh, tools like infected radar or infometer or the infected radar, which are used by many different European countries to survey influenza and other similar illnesses which occur across the country and across the world. And these are voluntary programs where uh, individuals are asked very simple questions on a routine basis around a week or a couple of weeks uh, to understand what is the disease status or the health status of an individual and his or her family. And this could provide very useful insights on emerging infections, not just in the country, but also be prepared to, to handle infectious diseases which might be occurring elsewhere in the country thanks to human mobility. And we have been able to pilot one such tool, which is called Infected Radar. Uh, you, you can access more about this uh, tool in here. And this is essentially a pretty digital surveillance program, which uh, would track volunteers on an anonymized fashion uh, on the infection status of these individuals over time. And this can provide very unique data sets on what is really happening in the infection status across different regions of the country. And of course, this would work well with a large number of individuals who are motivated uh, uh, to, to, to do this. And we do have a program called Epidemic Watch, which is a citizen science program 
which uh, which involves a large number of individuals who are excited and motivated to understand track outbreaks and also discuss outbreaks and, and how to go about acting them not just in india but also outbreaks across the world and idea is that can we use data sciences to understand outbreaks and tackle them better or be prepared uh, as an extent much better i think i'll stop there uh, and before that let me acknowledge a lot of people who made this possible fantastic colleagues in the lab uh, and fantastic colleagues who have now moved out of the lab uh, fantastic uh, collaboration uh, with dr shri dr subu for most of the next generation sequencing data set that i've talked about and a fantastic number of collaborators from across the country and uh, in many ways across the world as part of the who program for southeast asia uh, to insacog to the maharashtra cell surveillance program dr rajesh tarikarta who is here was in very key Uh, in 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 putting together the Maharashtra COVID nineteen program, and of course this will all happen with fund, and fund has largely come from uh, CSR in initial days, and from multiple different organizations including the DDP, the Maharashtra State Government, the Kerala State Government, and the WH. I think before I close, let me say that we need to think beyond humans, and we should really think about a one health approach and genomics is essentially central. your ability to understand and be prepared uh, for what happens next time